Well, I'll start it off. All right, good deal. All right. Clear your throat. <coughs> All right. La 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 la. Do a lot of spitting. And now the save versus nerd rage news. For a donation of twenty thousand dollars to charity. George R. R. Martin will kill you. Oh wait, it's already too late. Somebody already took that deal. Two people already took that deal. Shortlist.com reports, quote, For the princely sum of 11,895 pounds, or 2,000 U.S. dollars, George R. R. Martin will give two fans the chance to have a character named after them in a future Song of Ice and Fire novel, promising that they will share the fate of many beloved heroes by meeting a grisly death, end quote. The money will benefit the Wild Spirit Wolf Sanctuary, a non-profit organization which houses 60 wolves and wolf dogs, mostly rescues. Now, here we are with a uh, war correspondent, Uncle Z. I love the idea of it. I thought it was a great thing. I, uh, I actually volunteered at the Wolf Sanctuary across the highway from me, so uh, it, it's kind of a cause near and dear to me. The thing is, Uncle Z prefers the company of animals to most people. There's a wolf sanctuary across the road from you? The Wild Canyon Sanctuary, yep. Do you get any sleep at all at night? Yes. Okay. Because if anybody shows up my doorstep, I know where to take them. <laughs> you know, I buried most of my money across the highway, buddy. <laughs> all right. And speaking of money, what do you think of that price tag? Uh, $20,000, George R.R. R. Martin will kill you. Do you think that's a bargain price? Is that on the high end? I think it's a great way. I mean, he's only got, what, two books left to write in this series? Mm, could be. He probably could have gotten a lot more than that out of it. I'm willing to bet you dollars to pesos, and hopefully if all of it went to the charity, the better. Yes, this went to two charities, uh, specifically. Uh, one was the food depot in Martin's town of Santa Fe, New Mexico, and the other was the Wild Wolf, excuse me, the Wild Spirit Wolf Sanctuary. And he made, he had two slots for characters, uh, to be named in his books, and they were filled almost immediately. Yep. And I, I think it was a great idea. It was an opportunity for somebody to get that much closer to a fandom that they love and say, hey, in my own little way, I was a part of this. And it's good karma because I put forth for this greater thing. And I'm immortalized in something on HBO. <laughs> Dateline Harvard. Yes, it really is a book bound in human flesh. Harvard University has released a statement which indicates that the Harvard Library owns at least one volume covered with human skin. Who says? Harvard librarian Heather Cole, for one, says so. She had the book tested at Harvard's own Mass Spectrometry and Proteomedics Laboratory. That means somebody studied the charged particles and the proteins in the leather. A full explanation on the Harvard Library blog tells us that three different types of tests together indicated that the leather was distinctly Homo sapien skin. The book is Des Dienes de l'Ame, which translates from my own terrible French into Destiny of the Soul. The book contains French poetry 
and was published in Paris, France sometime in the 1880s. The raw material for the binding is believed to have come from the unclaimed body of a female patient in a French mental hospital. As of the time of this recording, the Harvard Library card catalog lists Destiny of the Soul as being in library use and not checked out. At least one other book in Harvard's collection is suspected as being bound in human flesh, possibly more than one. Uncle Z, what am I to make of this story? Tell me what to think. It's strange, but I don't think it was unheard of at the time. I mean, people did a lot of sick shit back then. Indeed. In anthropology news, an icon of vampiric literature has died. Professor Randu Florescu has died at age 88. Florescu was an expert on Eastern European history and advised the U.S. State Department on topics relating to the Balkans. Florescu himself immigrated from Romania to England during World War II when he was 13 years old. He studied in England and eventually came to the United States where he worked as a history professor at Boston College. Florescu was best known for his 1972 book In Search of Dracula. It was Florescu who first theorized that the legendary vampire was based upon the historic character of Vlad Tepes, also known as Vlad the Impaler. Florescu went on to author or co-author four more books about Dracula, one about Frankenstein and one about the Invisible Man. His latest book, Dracula's Bloodline, was published in 2013. So, Professor Florescu, dead at age 88. Uh, Dracula and Vlad the Impaler. Um, what is your take on this? Well, as I understand it, he's the one who historically tied Vlad the Impaler, Vlad Tepes, to the myths behind Dracula, right? That's what the New York Times is reporting, yes. So, he pretty much sparked off a huge pop culture slash horror phenomenon. Yeah, that's fair to say. Uh, I'm not familiar with any of his work. I'd never heard the name until you sent me the article. And uh, I'm kind of wondering what it was he used to tie the, the two together. Um, well, we'd have to read the book to find that find out, I guess. Is it bound in flesh in the Harvard Library? <laughs> I'm going to uh, perform a uh, online library search of the Harvard Library to find out if it has a copy of In Search of Dracula by Professor Florescu. Well, I mean... It, it, yeah, it sparked off probably a, a thousand different horror movie ideas, and uh, as far as I know, the best one had to be the Bram Stoker's Dracula with Gary Oldman and uh, Winona Ryder and the talented one from Bill and Ted's, or well, the successful one from Bill and Ted's <laughs> Adventure. And Uncle Z has been... <laughs> performing some independent research. Uh, we do like to do follow-up on stories that we have reported in previous episodes. Uh, so, what have you been working on, Uncle Z? Well, I believe back in February we covered the uh, feral chihuahuas in Arizona. And I remember this well. Yeah, the, I think we only got about three paragraphs of information saying they were a nuisance and it was the result of people abandoning foreclosed homes and abandoning basically a trendy pet and it was almost something out of a Stephen King movie. I can imagine an old man walking home at night and hearing an annoying yip and growl behind him and there's a single chihuahua and he keeps walking and then I can imagine another yip and there's three on the left side between the houses and then five across the road and there's the street light following him and it just gets worse and worse as it goes. So you made some phone calls to some local officials. What did you learn? 
uh, that they really know how to pass the buck. <laughs> I pretty much got to let me find someone who can answer that for you. And I got that about five times before I just finally said, it isn't worth it. <laughs> okay. Uh, I believe I, I made the call all the way out here from the bargain basement studio near St. Louis and was on the phone at least a half an hour playing past the buck with people about this. In Maricopa County. Mm-hmm. So if so either the Chihuahuas have taken over and there is a cover up involved or it's not much of a problem at the moment. Um what's your feeling? What is your take? It's probably not much of a problem anymore, is what I'm willing to bet. Mm-hmm. I'm a little disappointed by that too. And why so? Well, I'm a little bit of an outdoorsman, and I do like to hunt, but I only like to hunt invasive species. The most common one that everybody's probably heard about being feral hog. A lot of states yes. now, if you are an outdoorsman and hunting anything, they require you to take a hog if you're able to and happen to see one while you're hunting whatever else it is you're hunting. It's that bad. Yeah, I didn't know this until you explained it to me. If you're out hunting and you see a feral hog, the law says that you must shoot it. Yeah. And in Missouri... <laughs> in some jurisdictions. Yeah, in, in, yeah, in some jurisdictions. In Missouri, you can hunt them year-round with whatever you got. Which, uh, normally in Missouri, they only have rifle and bow hunting for their big game. Right, right. There's no shotgun hunting. And no trap hunting. So it, it's, you know, there's a lot of good big game out here in Missouri, but that's why they limit it that way. But it, if, if you got harsh language you think will care, kill a feral hog, do it. <laughs> but, uh. And what so type of sure. ammo does that take to do? Uh, it all depends on the size of the hog. I've seen people do it with the bow for anything between uh, 75 and under pounds using broadhead arrowheads. Um, I've used a 308 myself. I've used a uh, 1911 handgun chambered in 45 automatic. And on one, I had to use a shotgun with a one ounce deer slug. Okay, but we were talking about Maricopa. What's the connection here? I was really hoping for feral chihuahua hunts. <laughs> I mean, I can really imagine all the grandeur of it. And it wouldn't take much, just a little twenty-two long rifle. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, Maricopa doesn't have to approve the... Guys in the helicopters with the machine guns, like we have hunting the super hogs over Texas. Yeah, just a little, just a little twenty-two pistol or squirrel rifle, mm-hmm. and uh, give the hunters permission to shoot the feral chihuahuas. <laughs> yeah, I'm just picturing some like eight-year-old kid on his first hunt, holding up five chihuahuas by the tails and smiling and stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I'm somehow imagining South Park now and the whole excuse that's coming right for us. <laughs> oh, a call back to season one of South Park. Love that show. Save versus Nerd Rage. Love that show. Welcome back to Save versus Nerd Rage. I'm Scott Zaboam, and I am here with my friend and novelist. Trisha Sparks. Hey, Trisha. Hey, Scott. How is life in Trisha world? Um, actually pretty good right now. I mm-hmm. um, had the opportunity for an interview for a job recently, so that's kind of cool and exciting. Yes, yes. You are a novelist with a day job. You, mm-hmm. have, a, <laughs> you have a life outside of the world of words, don't you? Yes, I do. Uh, yet you have been able to piece together, what is it, five books now? I'm in my fifth right now, yes. That is, 
How do you do that? <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm barely finding uh, I'm barely finding time to put together my show, much less knock out five books. Well, first of all, the thing you have to keep in perspective is I've been working on these novels now probably seven years. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is that I wrote the first one, I wrote the second one, and I wrote the third one pretty much all at the same time. And then I started editing them. And I've been working... Okay. I had been working on the fourth and finished it recently, and then as soon as I finished the fourth novel, I went straight to working on the fifth novel. So it's not so much getting it all done at once, it's just appearing to have it all done at <laughs> once. <laughs> all right, that's... That's actually a very interesting um, methodology. Uh, would you recommend people doing it that way? It depends on what they're working on. If okay. you're working on um, something that's like a one-shot or maybe two-shot, mm -hmm. probably not so much. But if you've got a large series that you know is going to take time and energy, yep. I think that it might be better overall to release it in large chunks instead of one piece at a time. I know that as a reader... Not just myself, but my friends prefer to read everything all at once as opposed to reading a book and then waiting a year for the next one to come out and then <laughs> so on and so forth. It gets tiresome. It, it, it's like watching TV. You want to watch the whole first season rather than one episode at a time. Just put in the DVD and watch it all. That is so unlike me. I have no trouble watching an episode and then waiting for the next one. To each I'd own. much rather I'd much rather do that than sit through a than sit through a whole season of any show. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Uh, on top of that, you are also a story consultant. Yes. And I even brought you in to uh, consult on a short story that a friend of mine wrote. Um, what's it like being a story consultant? Yes. How's that? Being a story consultant is very interesting because you never know what you're going to get to read, first of all. It's fascinating to see how another writer's mind works and then to offer the support to find what it is that they need to figure out. Just looking at a piece, sometimes I can see, well, okay, you're going this way, but you're kind of not sure if you want to go down path A or path B. Is that more of a technical skill, or is it an emotional reading? Is it a gut reading of the story? For me, I think it's a gut reading of the story. Okay. I read something, and I can see which way it could go either way. Mm -hmm. But I look at it, and, well, what's going to be the most dramatic, if that's what the, re if the writer's looking for, or what's going to be the more tame version of it, mm -hmm. so that you can just rack it up that tension just a little bit at a time, yep. as opposed to just flooding the reader with it all at once. It it kind of is based on what I think the writer's trying to do with the work, and okay. once I'm done looking at it, I normally will talk to the writer and ask the question, of, okay, okay, the tension, the, the pacing, what are you looking for exactly, because if you're looking for this... If you're looking for the high tension, then I would go this way. If you're looking for the, the lower tension, I'd go the other way. It's just a matter of what the preference is for the writer. And do you ever tell the writer, no, you're doing it wrong? Have I ever told a writer, no, they're doing it wrong? <laughs> I think I've said... Where do you sugarcoat it? Um, mm -hmm. I think I've said no once before, on at least on one occasion, because... The, the writer in question was using a lot of heavy cliches, and I try to steer away from those as much as possible. And then there are the writers that are the frustrating ones who give you a start of the piece, and what they really want you to do is write the story entirely for them. They don't know <laughs> what they're doing. They just know that they want to write something, but they can't figure out what it is they want to write, so they, they look at you and go, well... Who should I put here? What should be here? Step by step, like Ooh. they want a finger painting from you <laughs> to fill in. <laughs> and that, for me, is probably the most frustrating type of writer to work with when consulting. Because I don't want to do the work for them. Mm -hmm. I want to see them put the work together themselves. Oh, it's very Taoist of you. 
So what do you do when a writer uh, shows up with a uh, page full of blanks like that? Well, what I end up doing normally is asking them what they want there instead of trying to fill it in for them. I mm-hmm. try, kind of try to turn it around and get them to fill it in for themselves. It doesn't always work, and when it doesn't, I'll say, look, I'm not going to write your story for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk about your stories now. You're working on book five of how many? Well, I know it's going to be six deep at least. Mm-hmm. I'm looking at the possibility of ten altogether. I can't even count that high. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> you can use your fingers. <laughs> ten full-length books? Yep. Um, it started out with one trilogy, okay. um, which I've been, which I've titled um, "The Mantle of the Gods." It started out that way. Yes. The first three books are titled um, "Quest for Truth," "Unmasking Truth," and Re- "Truth Revealed." Mm-hmm. Uh, the basic idea of this story is that a Interesting discovery leads to the return of the Greek gods that's heading towards the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. So, the first three books is a lot of exploratory, getting these mantles to come out and introducing characters. Now, what are the mantles? The mantles are items that were given to the gods by an yet unidentified individual that is supposed to give them the ability to pass on part of their power to a human being in order to subjugate the world. Um, Eris's bow, the um, trident of Poseidon, these kind of objects. Each of the mantles has a power in and of itself. Uh Um, The cup of Dionysus causes the person that comes in contact with it to be drunk and incredibly lustful. So... Running into a different god creates a different problem. Um, The first book tangles mainly with Hermes, which most people know him as the fleet-footed god, messenger god. Okay. But he's also the god of knowledge, so anything that's out there to be known, he knows. I see how that works. Except he's got holes in his memory because he doesn't remember how he got in prison to begin with. Mm Mm-hmm. So... He tempts you with the ability to have knowledge that you shouldn't have and to see things that most people wouldn't see. And what is his mantle? His mantle is a horn. Um, kind of like... Uh, it it kind of looks like um, an old-fashioned horn they used to put gunpowder in. Okay. That kind of a horn. But yes. it, it also could be used as an instrument, either one. Um, uh uh-huh. It's made of silver, it's got sapphires in it, and it's etched with feathers, denoting the winged sandals as well. But um, his mantle is the horn, and it causes all kinds of trouble. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, that sounds like Hermes. (laughs) There are ten of these gods in all. Okay. Okay. And Which one was the most fun to write? The most fun to write? Oh. Yeah. Ares has proven the most fun to write because he's been the most confusing. You'd think the God of War would come out guns blazing, ready to tear down the world. I would. But that's not what he does. He is very manipulative and controlling in the way he behaves. Um, mm-hmm. He starts out with one host, doesn't like that host, possesses somebody else who can't <laughs> use, and is now on his third host at this point in book four. Okay. And um, he's made some major deals to get to that host, too, so it makes it kind of interesting. Okay, so the reoccurring characters, the major characters are the gods, not the hosts. No, not the host, but there are other characters beyond the gods and their hosts, too. There's um, an archaeologist by the name of Anna. She is the one who ultimately made the discovery that leads to the gods' return. Um, There is a mixed martial artist fighter who's just getting to the the head of his career. 
has a dark past named Sam, who she ends up um, tangled up with. There's a cop who is currently B &E, a B and E cop named Lance. Um, he was a homicide detective and left under duress. Yeah. Um, there's a writer by the name of Catherine who has an interesting past in and of herself. She's running from something, but I'm not going to say what. Mm -hmm. um, and there are others in addition to them. There's um, a, a tomb raider named Zahara, which Anna can't stand. They have a history. <laughs> um, and there's a Masadi agent. Anna's sister, who she believes is a DJ, and she's not, so that makes for an interesting turn of events. Just a cast of different characters based on what's going on within the story itself. Okay. Now, this is where I reveal myself as being the bad interviewer who did not uh, read any of the books before, at, before interviewing the author. Okay. How does the fourth book differ from the trilogy? Because you said you started with the trilogy. Okay, the fourth book at this point... How did the fourth book happen? The fourth book was interesting in that I was continuing from where I left off that I'd introduced a character in the second book and she became this interesting shadowed figure that I wasn't quite sure who she was or what she was about. Mm -hmm. And she's been manipulating things from the from the background, and the fourth book really gives you an idea by the end of what it is she's after and what she's about. So it picks up where the third book left off. Um, the third book, you have Hades is in the mix, Ares has a minor role, Dionysus and Hermes are the four main figures, but there's this fifth shadowy figure that they all know, and nobody can quite get close to this person. Um, she's not a god, but she's not a human either. She's an interesting figure. Okay. And um, she has revenge plotted that has been go ongoing for years against the gods themselves for something that was done to her. And the fourth, fifth, and sixth book is her taking that revenge. So, where the gods were the driving force in the first three, now they're on the opposite side of the table. Okay. What are some of the themes in this story? In the fourth book? Or just overall? Oh, the whole series. Well, the one whole of the, Mant Mantle of the Gods series. Well, one of the things is definitely in the in the first three books is about facing your facing yourself and facing your fears. Um, each character, the the truth really is being unmasked or revealed. Um, there's a layer. There are different layers to the characters, and in, in particular, in the second book, you see a lot of people being unmasked and brought forward for who they actually are, mm -hmm. as opposed to who they've been perceived as. Okay. And what are the motivations of the gods? The gods. Yeah, what are they after? Are after. They want to restore their power. Um, they were once the um, controlling force of the world. Mm -hmm. And something happened, and they have fallen out of that power. So they're trying to come back into that power, but they're also, in the meantime, looking for a bride. They're looking to repopulate the world with their oh. personalities. They want to restore Make more the little Hercules. Ways. Yes, walk, exactly. Walking around. Okay. And right now, because Zeus is dead, they're also looking to become the new king of the gods. Mm -hmm. So they're competing with each other. Yes, they are. They are not working together at all. Okay. Uh, let's get into some of the uh, technical bits. Tell me a little more about your methodology. Like, uh, do you use a uh, notebook and pencil for your rough draft? Or do you go straight to the word processor? And which word processor are you using? There was a time when I wrote everything by hand before I typed anything. Mm 
Um, in fact, there was a time I couldn't even look at a computer screen without having a page written next to me. That time has passed, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> because I handwrite everything in pencil. So you come out with smudges and writing and go, what was I writing? I don't remember. Now I've got to fill in the blank. <laughs> um, now my methodology is such that I will literally take in three by five index cards and write on one card what each chapter is going to be. I outline mm -hmm. everything detailed. Now that doesn't mean that everything is done based on the outline when I start typing. Nine times out of ten, at some point, those cards get shuffled around out of diff in a different order, or oh. I'll have a scene written down that's like this long, and I'll decide, wait, I need to cut this in half, and this needs to become another scene. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, just because I outline 125 chapters doesn't mean that it's going to be 125 chapters. It may end up being 200. It just depends on what it is. And when I say 200 chapters, I'm not yeah. talking 200 chapters that are 20 pages each. I'm talking right. like a page and a half, maybe three pages. On occasion, I get eight pages, but they're That's usually... That's a trend, isn't it? The short chapters. A lot of young authors are doing that. Yes. And What's the story with the short chapters? Well, for me, the short chapters are mainly just so you know that you've switched character perspective. I'm not the type of person that writes in okay. one character's perspective. Mm -hmm. And it's easier for somebody reading it to know that they've switched perspective if I break the chapter. But also, I think it's easier for people to read these days a few pages at a time and be able to put it down and come back to it. As opposed to when you read a 20-page chapter and you read five pages, it's like, but I want to finish the chapter so I know how it ends. <laughs> this gives you the option to put it down without breaking a chapter. So, All right. so uh, what's your preferred format uh, when the book is finished? Uh, you like uh, you like uh, seeing it in ebook form, printed in paperback form. What's for me? I prefer paperback, but that's mm -hmm. just my style. I prefer to have the pages. I like the smell of them. I like the feel of them. Um, I like the look of the cover too. You, with an ebook, yeah, you get the image, but there's something about actually seeing it, the physical form, okay. that just draws my eye more. I, I don't know why. What's your favorite form of punctuation? Oh, probably a semicolon is my most commonly used form of punctuation. Oh, semicolons are awesome, aren't they? Yes, they <laughs> are. So underused. I would agree with that. <laughs> They often get mistaken for commas, so, <laughs> you know, you get those comma splice sentences, and most of the time what you need is a semicolon, but, oh, the grammar. Well, it, it takes courage to use a semicolon. Yeah. Um, because it's so rarely used. Yeah, it is. For... For me, I run long sentences. If you mm -hmm. ever get an email from me, it's horrifying. Because I tend to forget to, to punctuate, and it's all one long paragraph in one sentence, or maybe two or three. But still, the point is, it's way too much all at once. It's like, Patrice, yeah, you need to put a break in there so people can breathe. <laughs> oh, but no, I'll... All joking aside, my my grammar is probably my weakest point in my writing, and I literally have an amazing editor and my mother. She sit, mm -hmm. she sits with me for hours on end and goes through a chap chapter by chapter and helps me put together where the semicolons need to go, where the commas go, where the spelling of the word is incorrect. Yeah. Um, words that you like patience and patience. I always have the wrong patience. It doesn't matter how many times I tell myself it's the other one, I will spell the wrong word every time. <laughs> so my mom goes through, and she literally goes, okay, you've got the wrong patience. You've got the wrong past. Instead of walked past, you've got past as in the past. <laughs> um, she has more patience than I do for this sort of thing. But... Um, we're in the middle right now of editing mm -hmm. a collection of short stories that I actually started with on the net 
connected to the series to try to drum up interest in the series itself. Oh, I didn't even know about this project. Yes. All right, what's the name of this project? This one is Discovering Truth because it's connected to the original three the original three novels. Okay. It's kind of a companion piece in that it's got information that I hint at in the first three novels, but I don't actually get into in depth. Mm-hmm. Um, it goes into that information deeper. Uh, when I posted it originally online, there were four pieces that I posted. The new book will have three additional pieces beyond that, so it's got new content that wasn't on the web for those who have read it before. Okay. That's a good point. Um, a lot of your short stories are available on the web mm-hmm. um, for uh, listeners to find and sample. Where can they find that? It's trinitygateways.net is what it is. Um, I'm... I've got stories out there. My um, writing partner, Lisa, L.J. Gasno is out there, and Doris Ross is also out there. Doris is writing a dark fantasy um, series that she's calling um, Did, which is short for Descent into Darkness. And Lisa is writing several short pieces that she's put on the web, but she's got um, a series she's writing called The Crystal Garden Saga. She's actually in book three right now, and... If you like a good fantasy, I highly recommend it. It's an awesome series. If somebody goes to trinitygateways.net, what's the first story that you want them to read? Right now, it'd probably be my series that I, I've got called The Rogue Chronicles. It's a totally different flavor yeah. from what I'm writing currently mm-hmm. in the book series. Um, it involves a group of mages that exist in a world where some magic is acceptable and some is not. And for those that are outside of the accepted magic, they're called rogues. And they're either, they go to a a place called the Haven that is provided for them, or they go out on their own into the wasteland and exist by themselves. The lead character in that series is um, Kira. She's the daughter of one of the, the Council of Mages, and she finds herself in a situation where she has to flee the city. Because and when we're talking, talking city here, we're not talking, uh, me, we're not talking a medieval city. Oh, you know? far from it. There are cars and buses and other modern-day conveniences. But we're talking a concrete city. We're talking a concrete city that is surrounded by a stone wall. This is... You could have skyscrapers. It's a modern setting. Actually, it's more of a futuristic setting in that the world has fallen from what we know into a weird combination of the medieval and the present. Um, mm-hmm. My my characters are most commonly riding around on most motorcycles. Don't ask. I, I watched um, Sons of Anarchy got hooked and <laughs> decided to turn a character into somebody from that series. I don't know. <laughs> but um, the the lead character, she ends up on the outside and finds out that the rogues aren't what the world inside the wall has described them as at all. There's a whole other level of what's going on. And that the world she knows and the world that exists are two separate things entirely. All right. So what's the name of book five, the book that you're writing now? And the title of the book I'm writing right now is Hellish Night. Book four is... Um, is that Night with a K or Night with an N? Night with an N. Um, the titles for that particular group, there will be three of them, are yeah. all going to have the word night connecting them. The, the sixth one is City of Night, the fifth one is Hellish Night, and the first one I want to say is night rising that's what it is so all right and uh and that what's happening in and in, in, what's happening in hellish night right now oh what's, wow um what's happening in hellish right night right now is I've got a yeah, group give of, us some spoilers I've got a group of characters that are trapped on a on a um, lifeboat the boat that they had been on in book four has sunk. I'm not going to explain how, but it okay. has sunk. They are trapped on this boat, 
and they are being pursued by Hermes, who is trying to locate Ares, who is one of the passengers on the boat, mm -hmm. as a result of, of an order coming from this shaded character. Her name is Hecate. She has taken control of Ares, uh, of Hermes, and is looking to do the same with Ares. Mm -hmm. So, um, I've got a, I've just had them come onto an island after narrowly escaping a hurricane that was chasing them. So, um, I've got that group there, and then Sam and Anna are trying to track and locate their friend Lance, who's also in this group, um, because of what has happened. He is in possession of Ares' mantle right now, so... So it's Gilligan's Island with gods. A little All bit, right. yes. Yeah, I like that vibe. <laughs> A little bit, yes. <laughs> um, while that's going Has on... Has anyone worn a toga yet? Has anyone... Well, yeah, actually, in the... the there's, um, there is a character that's a writer, and her character that she's created is um, a vampirist who lives in kind of a Roman-esque world. So um, I've had a couple of encounters throughout the series in which you've seen some of my main heroines in togas, the mm -hmm. old-style Grecian, either because of that or because of being lost in the dream realm. Okay. So, yes, there have been appearance of togas. <laughs> now, you do a lot of research before you write your fiction. Yes. Uh, and I think you enjoy doing that. What type of research did you do before writing this series? Well, a lot of what I know about the Greek, Greek and Roman gods, I actually is stuff I've known for a long time. It's always kind of fascinated me. I think that's why it ended up spilling into my writing. But um, I've gone out online on several occasions to find information on locations that are being um, referred to in the, in the books. Um, I visited Vegas. I visited California's Los Angeles. I've got a scene in New York. I've got scenes in Tel Aviv in Israel. Um, I've got one at the Dead Sea, and there was a lot of research involved in just getting a feel for the land so that I could explain where I was at, or so that if even the details that I didn't actually include, you know, while I may not have included as much detail as most people, um, what I gave was accurate, because I wanted to Very make cool. sure that the environment was appropriate. Yes. And I also did some research just to scout locations for, for places that I wanted to use in the story. Like, for book five, I've got Hades running to hell. Literally, I think it's... So this is a globetrotting story, plus some other places. Yes. Excellent. Ed, said, did you set anything in your hometown? No, I have not set anything in Jacksonville, Florida. I have set some scenes in Miami because of the the need to be near the Bermuda Triangle. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> but no, nothing in Jacksonville as of yet. All right. Uh, last question. All right, excellent. And what do you say to your fans? Um, well, I say that I hope you have been, you're enjoying the adventure, both whatever's online and what I'm, what I'm printing, but I also hope that you'll continue to follow and just, you know, enjoy the, the story that's being told because for me, the, the joy of it is just writing it. Um, I love the creation of a world. There's something about it that just grabs hold of me and I don't want to let go of it, so. I'll probably be doing this until the day I die. <laughs> <laughs> I endorse this plan. <laughs> All right, the website is trinitygateways, plural, dot net. And is there a Trinity Gateways Facebook page? Yes, there is. All right. Is there a Twitter account? Yes. Is there a Google Plus page? No, ah, right gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> I don't 
don't know if there is one or not. I know I've got a Google Plus page, but I haven't used it in so long, I don't even know what's on it. <laughs> Uh, one of the more interesting things you can also find if you're a writer out on trinitygateways.net is what's called my writer's desk. It's kind of yes. a bunch of tips and tricks and, and other just formatting and other things that you might find useful if you're trying to write for the first time. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, you'll hear from our listeners, but um, uh, don't worry, they're not nearly as mean as they uh, make themselves appear to be. <laughs> okay. Yeah, they've had their shots. <laughs> Understood. And tell them if they ever run into me and I come across as cold that the big um, fuck you across my forehead is not <laughs> personal, it's just me. There's also, of course, Ancient City Con. Although, don't, don't tell my listeners where you live. No, They're not, not that trustworthy. Not going to tell them where I live. <laughs> um, there's also Ancient City Con, which yes. will be in June next year. Yeah, you just attended uh, Ancient City Con yep. for uh, 2013. Mm-hmm. Was How was that experience? It was good. We got to meet a lot of interesting people while we were there. Um, we had a table set up. And we sold some books this year, which was pretty cool. Yes. Was there a guy, was there that convention guy walking around with the convention funk? <laughs> that uh, that odorous aura about him? Actually, yes, That's there at was. every convention? There was somebody here yes. <laughs> that we ran into at one point. It's like, oh, you've been, out, you've been inside too long. You need to go outside. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it was a lot of fun, the convention was, this year, but, oh, for anybody who's listening, this is definitely an adult content series, especially once Dionysus steps into the page. I do not <laughs> recommend it for small children. Don't Rated A for, oh my god. <laughs> yes! <laughs> yes. Oh, that was an experience, too. Giving my mom the second book to read. Oh, my gosh. I thought I was going to die. <laughs> but, you know, every writer goes through it, and I guess you have to get it over and done with. <laughs> my so the spicy stuff starts in the second book. Yes. Dionysus comes into into play in the second book, and he will be... Does the series get spicier and spicier as it goes along? It does for a while. It okay. kind of cools off a little bit in book four. Mm -hmm. Actually, no, it's book five it finally cools off a little yeah. bit. So the book two... To well, they're in a lifeboat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but How much mischief can you get into in a lifeboat <laughs> surrounded by other people? Not a whole lot. Who are, at, who are upset with you. <laughs> <laughs> not a whole lot. Definitely not. Great, and that is our interview with Trisha Sparks. Save versus Nerd Rage. Hello, everyone. It's Uncle Z here for the Save versus Nerd Rage show. And I have a segment I want to do called Suggestions for Gamers, whether they be GMs or the players themselves, game masters, storytellers, whatever you call yourself, the head honcho, or the players, whom we just call players. Uh, and it was just the most awesome fantasy creature idea in the history of ever that I came up with after slamming back two Red Bulls and thinking to myself, man, I fucking hate hipsters. I cannot wait to hear this. Yes. I've come up with the weird hipster. I've decided it's a bard class that'll, or that only plays music no one's ever heard of. And if you suffer his bite and fail the check against him with Canthropy, you immediately suffer negative 10 charisma, except amongst other weird hipsters. <laughs> if you didn't have facial hair before, you do now. Does uh, this apply to females? Damage. I'm sorry? Do the females get facial hair also? No. I'm not sure what to... Uh, I believe female hipsters would probably just become more condescending. 
<laughs> but uh, after it immediately sets in, you slowly start suffering damage from all foods you eat that aren't locally grown in the region. And you can't drink any alcohol made from a regional pub. It's all got to be locally made. <laughs> I figure their music doesn't do anything to buff or boost their own party, but it would cause any opposition to fly in a rage and just attack with whatever's in their hand. It would incite an immediate rage toward the, uh, towards the werehipster and anyone hindering the chances of killing the werehipster, which would basically cause a player party to fight amongst themselves to see who gets the right to kill the, hip the werehipster. <laughs> and if you have any hate mail for Uncle Z, you can reach us at facebook.com slash save versus nerd rage. Be advised, any hate mail you sent may get read on the show in a happy voice. Save versus Nerd Rage. This week's music brought to you by MAFX at Profit Motive Media. We have also used the Tiberian National Anthem by Tanner Helland, which is generously released and licensed under a Creative Commons Attribute Share Alike 3.0 license at TannerHelland.com. Do you want to contact the folks at Save vs. Nerd Rage? You can catch us on Facebook. Guess what that name is? Save vs. Nerd Rage. Look us up. You'll find us. Feel free to send comments, feedback, or all the hate in your heart. We welcome it. Thank you, and have a wonderful day. Filled with rage. 